Hey, welcome back. We're talking about respiratory diseases today. Uh, it's related to comparative anatomy. So uh, everything we've been talking about um, with the respiratory system and relating that to the different diseases we'll see in different species. Respiratory disease is simply the reduction in ability to remove a proliferation of secretions and exudative material. What does that mean? Gunk, that respiratory gunk that builds up in your throat, in your nose, uh, that you need to get out of the out, out of your airway so that you can breathe better. So the goal of the therapy for respiratory disease is to reduce the volume of those secretions and exudative material, reduce the viscosity to make it a little bit looser so it's easier to get out, uh, make that removal easier, alter the inspired air. We may use expectorants. And what are expectorants? They are things that help us to remove uh, this uh, secretion or this exudative material from our respiratory tract. Antitussives are things that keep us from coughing. So they reduce the reflex uh, of coughing. Bronchodilation is to open up the airways uh, so that we can get air in and out a little bit more easily and to control, in, uh, we want to control the infection and inflammation that, it, that may be occurring. We, want it, we may need to modify some of these secretions, like you said, reduce the viscosity and improve the, the drainage uh, and, and uh, remove the inspired air. So the different res respiratory diseases we'll talk about through different species are uh, rhinitis, nasal tumors, epistaxis, sinusitis, tonsillitis, and laryngitis, and those are the upper respiratory diseases. Rhinitis is an inflammation, can be from infection, but it is uh, uh, described as or defined as inflammation of the nose or the nasal cavity. What we'll see are serous mucoid or mucopurulent nasal discharges it can be from one side or the other, but usually with rhinitis, the entire nose is involved, and so you'll see it bilaterally or on both sides. They may be sneezing or pawing at the nose, coughing or gagging. Uh, you'll see encrustation on the nares, and this is uh, encrustation uh, where the arrows are pointing. Uh, it's just a crusty um, discharge. Usually you'll see more respiratory signs, not just rhinitis. So rhinitis is usually secondary to something else that's going on. So we diagnose it based on these clinical signs. Um, if we can do a culture insensitivity, what we often grow out is staphylococcus uh, bacteria. Treatment, we need to clean out the nares. Uh, apply ointment to the outside if we've got some discharge that's causing some skin problems. We may have to put them on sy systemic antibiotics, vasoconstrictive drugs uh, and antihistamines to help uh, relieve the congestion or the swelling that is occurring in the nasal cavity, uh, phenylephrine or uh, pseudo pseudofed neosinephrine drops up the nose. Animals don't really like it, but it does help them to clear up their nasal passages and get air in and out a little bit more easily. Ephedrine is another uh, vasoconstrictive drug that we can use. I've got cleft palate up here because cleft palate can be a, a cause of rhinitis and cleft palate is a congenital defect, sometimes genetic and sometimes it's just a uh, malformation when they are forming in the womb. Uh, the two sides of the hard palate should be grown together when they are born and if it is not completely grown together, there's a hole from the mouth into the nose and of course anything that goes in the mouth can then get up into the nose which can cause inflammation just from the foreign material being there. Nasal tumors, uh, with nasal tumors, we'll see a unilateral mucoid nasal discharge, so it's usually just on one side. It's typically unresponsive to therapy, and in this case, therapy means antibiotics. We usually start with antibiotics, sometimes antifungals. We may see some nasal hemorrhage or epistaxis, and sometimes it, it you get a sneezing reflex um, just because of where the tumor is and, and the nerves that it's uh, touching. Uh, this can be uncommon, though. Um, we can do x-rays to try to locate that mass. We can do endoscopy. This is a, a endoscopy. It's actually showing a nasal mite, which it can be another cause of rhinitis or um, nasal disease. Um, biopsy. We can do a biopsy to see what it is, what's growing in there. Uh, we can remove 
uh, this through surgery, but it's typically only palliative, meaning it just gives us a little bit more time um, and, and gives them a little bit more comfort. Um, masses usually tend to recur. This x-ray shows a mass within the bone, and you can see that it's actually eating away at the bone. The bone is white, and when we see this blackness occurring within where the bone should be, that's called lysis of the bone, so it's, it's removing bone. And this here is the tumor, um, and it's just it's kind of made up of bone and probably cartilage uh, tissue. Uh, it's most likely a, uh, uh, it's a nasal carcinoma. Uh, so um, can be very um, destructive uh, within the nasal cavity. I have this up here, uh, this uh, no smoking sign, because unfortunately, uh, when animals breathe in secondhand smoke, it can cause a lot of issues. Uh, we do recommend that people don't smoke around their pets. They can get nasal tumors, they can get asthma, um, some other, uh, we have other concerns with that as well. Epistaxis or a nosebleed, it's usually bleeding from one versus uh, two, no, uh, two of both nares, so one side versus both. Um, it's usually associated with trauma or foreign objects, so if they get something up their nose, for instance, if a, a dog is sniffing in the grass, there are these little grass-ons uh, that in, are in certain grasses that are seed pods, uh, but they have little spiky um, projections on them and those grass ons can actually get into the nose and then travel throughout the body uh, because of the way that they're shaped. Uh, other foreign objects like sticks, um, we found sticks and, and splinters and, and uh, grass and lots of different things up the nose. Um, tumors, uh, of course we just talked about tumors can cause epistaxis as well. Diagnosis, obviously we can see a, a nosebleed. We, for treatment, we need to locate the exact site of the bleeding, stop the bleeding. We can use sometimes vasoconstrictive drugs like epinephrine or ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, uh, to um, uh, for the, get the vessels to clamp down on themselves. Apply pressure if we can. If this is a coagulopathy, meaning they don't have the right blood, uh, the clotting mechanism, sometimes vitamin K will help that clotting mechanism to work a little bit better. Sinusitis usually involves frontal or maxillary sinus in dogs, and the most common cause for sinusitis in dogs is a tooth root abscess. Uh, we, will, we will see a unilateral nasal discharge and swelling under the eye on that side of the bad tooth. Antibiotics um, can help to treat this, but we do need to remove that infected tooth and open that up for drainage so it drains down into the mouth. Uh, we want to flush those fistula tracts with an antiseptic solution, but I warn you to be very cautious because if you look at where the sinus is, it can actually uh, penetrate up, the infection can penetrate through the bone into the socket of the eye and sometimes the antiseptic solutions that we're using are very damaging to the eye, and so we can cause some major eye damage if we flush through there with an antiseptic solution that gets into the eye. To diagnose, obviously, we're going to examine the nasal and oral cavity. Uh, radiographs, if uh, we have bone in involved, um, that's resorption of the bone or lysis of the bone. And we always recommend, whenever you're doing an ex or a dental cleaning of animals, to at least yearly uh, or every other year get x-rays, just like you would when you, when you go to the dentist, to make sure that we're not, things that we're seeing on the surface um, are not um, worse underneath the surface in the bone. We can do a culture and sensitivity to give us the right idea of where to go with the antibiotics. Here is a picture of the sinuses. These are the frontal sinuses. Here are the maxillary sinuses. The maxillary sinus uh, is very close to the tooth root um, normally, and it doesn't take very much if we have an infected tooth root for the bacteria to eat through the thin bone and get into the sinus. And from the sinus there, you can see it's very close to the uh, orbital cavity of the, the eye and it will, again, eat right through there and you'll get discharge in the eye as well. Horse sinus diseases. They have several air-filled cavities uh, within their head as well, above, below, and between the eyes bilaterally. And the cheek teeth roots are contained within the bony floor of these sinuses. So, uh, and that floor is very thin and it's, it's very distorted, it's easily distorted 
with any pressure changes. So it can cause some discomfort. The sinusitis is basically the same for dogs and cats, but they can also uh, have wounds or fractures that damage their sinuses, cancers and fungal infections. We see in typically older horses and we'll see some mixed clinical signs, sometimes some outward swelling uh, in this MRI or CT scan. You can actually see that this is an air filled sinus and this is a sinus that is filled with something else. It could be a mass, it could be a blood clot. Not really sure what, what that substance is and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's not supposed to have broken through the, the uh, sinus cavity here and created a lump on the outside. Now there's, you can see tissue here, but this is bigger on this side. So I'm sure there's a swelling on this side of the horse's head. So you'll see that outward swelling, uh, persistent mucus discharge, maybe a persistent and intermittent trickle of blood, uh, typically through the nose. You'll smell a bad odor and sometimes they'll be fe uh, feverish and, and be depressed. Um, Benign tumors, we can surgically correct. We can remove them and they won't come back. Malignant tumors and fungal infections are very difficult uh, to treat in the sinuses. They can also get sinus cysts. It's possibly a developmental pro uh, problem. Um, it invades the sinus cavity and traps straw-colored secretions within large, thin-walled cavities. We'll get a unilateral persistent nasal discharge and swelling. We can do um, endoscopy and surgically remove that, and that's curative. There's also something called a progressive ethmoid hematoma. We, we don't know what the cause of this is, but basically it's a massive tissue that's composed of a mature blood clot and surrounded by a membrane. Uh, so we'll get mild persistent epistaxis, and again, we can remove this surgically uh, with through endoscopy, and it's curative, but you can see that here. Guttural pouches. Guttural pouches exist in horses. Um, they are unique to horses. They are like a, a sinus. Uh, they have a one-way valve, or I'm sorry, it's a two-way valve in which you have air coming in and air going out. We do think that this may have something to do with their ability to run long distances because it's just another um, air, place to trap air, kind of like uh, the air sacs that we find in birds also helps to make their head a little bit lighter than it would normally be. Uh, the diseases we find with this guttural pouch are empyema, uh, which is caused by a streptococcus infection. Empyema means it's a pussy discharge or a purulent discharge. We will need to uh, use antibiotics and lavage out those uh, guttural pouches, which we can do by uh, placing an endoscopy tube up uh, into the nose and flushing it out through the uh, through the tube we have there. Timpani is, uh, if you know what timpani are, they're um, orchestral drums. They have uh, they're large kettle drums. Um, and what we have with, with timpani is air is going into the guttural pouch, but not able to come out. We see these in foals. Um, so fillies usually more than uh, the, the, the female col uh, colt or the female foal versus the male foal. Uh, inflammation or malformation of the pharyngeal orifice of the eustachian tube is a is where why we see this problem. What happens is then we we have a one-way valve, so air goes in, but it doesn't come out. It's typically non-painful for these little guys, um, but uh, but it is it 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 does cause a swelling, and it actually uh, is so swollen that you can actually see it from the outside of the animal. Um, we can use, if, especially if it's an uh, inflammation issue, we can use steroids or antibiotics and, and try to um, uh, open up that valve so that air can move in and out again. Mycosis um, is a fungal infection. Aspergillus or aspergillosis is the main fungus that we see growing in this uh, fungal infection in the guttural pouch. And what we'll see is a um, major epistaxis due to the erosion of the wall of the carotid artery. So if you look at the anatomy of the guttural pouches, they are just below the brain, just below the uh, cranium uh, skull, uh, and they are just above the glottis or the trachea, the opening to the trachea, and they're on uh, the inside of the um, just inside the mandible uh, and under the ears here. 
And what runs on the outside of this guttural pouch is the common carotid artery. So if we have an infection in that guttural pouch and it eats through the wall of the guttural pouch, which is fairly thin, the next stop is the wall of the common carotid artery or the external carotid artery. So it, uh, the common carotid artery comes up and splits into the external and internal carotid arteries. And these are major vessels. And so if we have a fungal infection that eats through the wall of this, we will have major bleeding and the animal will actually bleed out within seconds. This is very scary. The other thing that can cause uh, major bleeding is if they have a rupture of the longus capitis muscle. The longus capitis muscle is up here on the top of the head. Uh, Horses uh, can sometimes uh, often get frightened very easily. And if they rear up and they're in an enclosed space and they hit the pole of their head on top of or on something, it can actually, they can do it with such force that it actually ruptures that muscle, can fracture the skull. And that traumatic pole injury can actually cause rupture of the external carotid artery uh, because of the damage to the guttural pouch. Sheep and goats, their sinus nasal diseases. Uh, nasal bot is the main thing that we think about. Um, it's a nasal bot is uh, the estrus ovis fly. It's the uh, larvae of the estrus ovis fly. It uh, causes profuse nasal discharge. First, we're going to get a clear and mucoid discharge. Then it becomes mucopurulent. And then finally, it's streaked with blood. Um, they will have sneezing fits because of this little larvae living in their nose. If it's trapped in the sinus, it can become calcified or lead to a very septic sinusitis, meaning that this, uh, the sinusitis becomes then a systemic infection. They tend to have poor condition. These sheep and goats will have a poor condition because it's very annoying. They can't even eat. Sheep will run from place to place or stand in a circle uh, with their head lowered. So they're trying to escape that adult fly that's trying to get into their nose to lay their eggs. We can use ivermectin to treat this. It's a common parasiticide. Uh, we do need to remember that it does have a withdrawal time, so we can't uh, process these animals for meat uh, for some time after we uh, use ivermectin. In cattle, uh, they do get a, an allergic rhinitis. Often, uh, or many times, cattle can be allergic to pollen or fungal spores. Um, it is somewhat uh, uncommon. Um, it can become chronic, and if it is chronic, it'll lead to a granuloma formation within the nose. Sinusitis is a little bit more common, and it will happen if we have issues with uh, infected tooth roots or we are not dehorning them properly. So what I have here is a picture of a cross-section of the head of a calf, and you'll see that the horn bud is very close to the frontal sinus. And if we cut too far down and open up that frontal sinus, uh, often we can get bacteria, fungus, uh, some other things into this frontal sinus and will cause an infection. Um, and uh, signs of this would be anorexia, that it's too sick to eat, pyrexia, uh, unilateral or bilateral nasal discharge, changes in air, airflow. Um, you'll, you may actually see as they breathe, you can see that the um, uh, skin here going in and out with the breaths that they take. Um, a foul breath and an abnormal head shape. Treatment is to drain with tree fine sites. That means we're drilling holes into the skull, lavaging it out um, using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and antibiotics if it becomes a systemic. Birds, um, avian mycoplasmosis is a um, disease that they can get into their sinuses. It's a uh, mycoplasma bacteria. Uh, it's very difficult to treat. They can also get an avian metanumavirus, which is a, a viral infection of um, turkey poults uh, that causes turkey rhinotracheitis. Uh, this is a little um, guy, and we have a uh, trimmed beak here. And uh, if we trim it too far back, it will, and they have, we have bacteria in the environment, they can actually get an infection in their nares, which uh, then leads to a sinus infection. Here's a maxillary sinus infection um, of a little turkey poult. Tonsillitis. Tonsils, um, you probably know a little bit about tonsils. Uh, kids often get uh, tonsillitis. Um, that's because the tonsils, they're the lymph nodes that are the, the first site where, uh, of 
where the respiratory tract starts. So that's the first place that will get a reaction to any disease that's coming in. They're called the sentinels of the respiratory tract. And that's why I have my little transformer guy, the sentinel. Um, they can cause anorexia. If you've ever had strep throat and your tonsils have been enlarged, you know you don't want to eat. Uh, increased salivation, pain when you're opening the mouth. Um, we can see the tonsils when we open the mouth. They're at the back of the tongue, just on top of the, um, on either side of the soft palate. They could have a, a mucus, pus, or plaques right on the surface that you can see. To treat, we often put them on systemic antibiotics. We want to give them a soft or liquid diet. If you've ever had your tonsils out or had a uh, tonsillitis, you know that um, the best thing are, are uh, popsicles and ice cream. We don't really suggest that for your animals, but you can understand that a soft diet is much more comfortable to eat. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, two to three times a day for dogs. Um, but we have to remember with cats, we want to only give it every other day or every third day because they don't metabolize these and get sick very easily from non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Surgical removal is done if we have a chronic tonsillitis or, an, or we have cancer. Uh, so they can get a tonsillectomy. Laryngitis is, the most com is most commonly caused by excessive vocalization. Uh, it can also be caused by infection. So any infection in that area can cause swelling of the larynx. Uh, clinical signs would be a loss or a change in voice. Um, we have to remember that rabies also can cause um, a change in that because it, it causes laryngeal paralysis. There are other causes of laryngeal paralysis um, that can cause a, a loss or change in voice. So we want to look at the larynx pretty carefully to see if we can discover what is causing this change in the voice. Um, cough, um, it, it's, it's irritating, it's inflamed, and so cough is a reflex. Uh, increased mucus in the back of the throat. Anytime we have an inflammation in these epithelial cells, we have, we have to remember we have goblet cells that produce mucus there, and so they're going to increase the mucus production to help protect the uh, lining of the epithelial cells. History and, uh, and the physical exam will give us our diagnosis. We need to restrict vocalization. Often you hear people with laryngitis and say, don't, people say, don't talk, don't talk. It's because uh, the more you talk, the worse it, be, it becomes. So you need to try to keep them from vocalizing. Antibiotics, if it is infected, and anti-inflammatories. We can use glucocorticoids, which are steroids. Um, we have to be very careful with steroids because they cause a lot of problems. Um, we also often, with steroids, we, we give it a certain dose for a certain period of time, and then we start to taper that dose. So we slowly take them off the steroids so their body can adjust to being uh, not having that steroid um, given to them daily. Upper airway disease information for clients is that upper airway disease is usually self-limiting. Treatment is aimed at comfort of the animals. So we want to make the animals comfort. We want to get them comfortable. We want to get them to eat. And it, eventually this will usually will go away. If it is a tumor of the nasal cavity or the tonsil, they're most commonly squamous cell carcinomas. Um, infections, if we do have an infection, we like to do a culture and sensitivity to figure out what's going on, and it can require several weeks of treatment. Diseases of the lower respiratory tract. The diseases we're going to talk about here are tracheobronchitis, so inflammation of the trachea and bronchi, tracheal collapse, feline asthma, feline viral respiratory infections, and pneumonia. Heart, um, heartworm disease, especially in cats, cancers, pulmonary edema, chemothorax, and pneumothorax. So I'm going to try to fix these links for you. Um, this uh, link, I would click on it, but what I've noticed is when I click on it, when I'm doing this presentation, you can't actually hear uh, the um, the presenter talk about why we hear ronchi rails or crackles and wheezes, but you can see the pictures of what he's talking about. Ronchi is a sound that we hear um, that is air passing through a tube that is smaller than normal. It's made smaller than normal because of increased secretions or, or thick mucus, um, but it is a sound of uh, air passing through a tube that it sounds rougher than normal. So instead of hearing a breath sound that is very quiet, you hear it, and that's ronchi. 
Rails or crackles are what we hear when the alveoli of the respiratory tract of the, of the lungs are uh, crackling or when they're moving, you can actually hear them moving. They're not moving silently anymore. They're moving uh, and you can hear fluid moving through the air or you can actually hear the tissues rubbing together. And those are called crackles just because it sounds like crackling paper. So what you will hear is a <laughs> when an animal is breathing. When you hear an animal breathing in inspiration and you're hearing <gasps> that sound uh, with an inspiration sound usually means we have an upper respiratory airway disease. When you're hearing breathing that sounds funny on expiration, that means we have a lower airway disease. Wheezes are sounds that we hear when the uh, lungs are not, uh, are, are, the air is moving through very small spaces or bronchoconstriction, constricted airways. And so you hear a high pitch sound like it. Uh, that is the sound of a wheeze. And these, um, if you click on this uh, icon, you will be able to hear some of those uh, sounds so you can really understand what they sound like so that when you listen to an animal and you're not hearing something normal, you'll be able to uh, diagnose what is going on. Infectious canine tracheobronchitis is the fancy name for kennel cough. Kennel cough is caused by a collection of agents. It can be any one of these or multiple um, causes. So viruses, bacteria, mycoplasms, which is a um, coated, or it's a, a bacteria with very strong cell walls, fungi, and parasites. Diagnosis is through clinical signs of history, cough on tracheal palpation, and they're otherwise healthy. So a tracheal palpation is when we push on the trachea indent it just a little bit, and if they cough immediately, we know that they have inflammation or damage to the trachea. Um, but it, with kennel cough, usually they're acting just fine. They don't act sick. They just have this irritation in their throat that causes a reflex of cough. Um, we need to rule out pneumonia. We need to do x-rays to rule out pneumonia, make sure they don't also have pneumonia, because if we treat them the way that we need to treat them for kennel cough, we can actually make pneumonia worse. So we wanna make sure that we don't have pneumonia when, they have, when we hear coughing. If we have a chronic or severe tracheobronchitis and we're having trouble getting it taken care of uh, with the usual antibiotics and, and treatment, um, we can do a tracheal lavage to do some diagnostics. And basically what that does, it, that means is we're placing um, a, a sterile tube into the trachea uh, flushing through with a little bit of saline and immediately aspirating that back out so that we can figure out what cells and bacteria or fungus may be growing in there. Uh, clinical signs are a history of exposure to other animals at a kennel, hospital, grooming facility, show, dog park, backyard. Um, animal, uh, people can say, oh, my dog never goes anywhere. Um, and I ask about, you know, if they have uh, fence contact with any other animals that might possibly go somewhere and turns out that they do, then we, we have our answer of how they got it. They will have a dry, hacking, paroxysmal cough, meaning it's just absolutely reflexive and otherwise they'll be very healthy. Now, usually this cough happens more at night, night when they're lying down because there's a little bit more pressure on their trachea. And so it will keep owners up at night and that becomes a problem. We want to give them antibiotics if we have a deeper respiratory involvement or if they're feverish. And we want to base that um, choice of antibiotics on our culture and sensitivity. Glucocorticoids uh, or prednisone at an uh, anti-inflammatory dose. We can use uh, trimeprazine um, with prednisolone, prednisolone, which is temeral P. It's called temeral P. And trimeprazine is a antihistamine and prednisolone is a steroid. You can also use just straight old prednisone or prednisolone uh, for a few for five to seven days and then taper off on those. Antitussives. This is where it's important that we um, diagnose that we don't have a pneumonia, both because we're giving steroids, which can delay healing, 
and also because we have antitussins. Um, antitussins keep the animal from coughing, and if an animal has pneumonia, we need them to cough that junk out of their lungs. So if we keep them from coughing and they have pneumonia, we're actually making the pneumonia worse. Hycodan, uh, codeine, butorphanol, robitussin, those are things that work as antitussives. We can also use bronchial dilators if they're really having difficulty breathing or have a lot of junk in their trachea or their bronchi. Aminophylline or tributylene are two bronchial dilators will, which will open up the airways. We want to tell the client that it can be self-limiting. Um, disease usually lasts about two to three weeks, especially if it's mainly viral. Treatment is aimed at making the animal and owner more comfortable. So the, if they're coughing less, the owner is more comfortable, they're able to sleep at night, and of course the animal is more comfortable as well. There are vaccinations. If we're gonna use the injectable vaccine, we need to give it two to three weeks prior to boarding. It takes longer to uh, start working in the system, but a vaccination with an intranasal vaccine can be given much closer to the time of exposure. So we could give an intranasal vaccine within five to seven days of them going to a boarding facility. There are also intraoral vaccines as well. And the vaccine just reduces the severity of disease. So if there is kennel cough at the kennel, um, the best choice is not to go to that kennel. Uh, but if they have to go to the kennel, then having the vaccine on board can be helpful. Feline Bordetella. So the vaccine for, for canines is Bordetella bronchoseptica. Feline uh, can also get a Bordetella bronchoseptica vaccine, but they get the disease a little bit differently. What we see with feline Bordetella bronchoseptica is that they colonize the ciliated respiratory mucosa and then release toxins that are responsible for local and systemic inflammation. And it looks just like respiratory viral infection. So it's a bacteria, but it looks like a viral infection. It's normally self-limiting in cats, but can use uh, can cause a bronchopneumonia and fatalities in, in young kittens. So here again, we have to be really careful. They may be coughing. Uh, we may be tempted to give them something to re relieve the um, inflammation and relieve the cough, but it can actually uh, be fatal uh, to animals if we do so. As clinical signs, they will be more sick. They'll have fever, seizing, nasal discharge, submandibular, mandibular, um, lymphadenopathy, so swollen lymph nodes, coughing and rails. What are rails? They're crackles. You'll actually hear the crackling in the chest. Uh, if we can culture the oropharynx, so the back of the mouth, um, we can actually get a diagnosis of this. Uh, treatment is uh, uh, antibiotic treatment with tetracycline or doxycycline, two antibiotics that will be very helpful uh, in the treatment of Bordetella. Prevention Bordetella is more, uh, more common in cats that are in multi-cat households or catteries. This is a much more stressful environment for cats to be in. We want to make sure that we have good hygiene, good nutrition, isolate those sick cats, and then vaccinate. We want to tell the client that it looks like feline herpes and Khaleesi virus, uh, which, are, which can be uh, more chronic and in some cases more deadly. We absolutely recommend if we have a multi-cat household or a cattery where they're breeding cats, we vaccinate uh, cats against this because it's very infectious to other cats. Collapsing trachea is a disease we often see with dogs and most often middle-aged, older, obese, toy, and miniature breeds. The cause is unknown. Um, it may be caused by a reduction in glycogen and glycosaminoglycan content of the hyaline cartilage. And remember that cartilage is what is making up a majority of the shape of the tracheal ring. Um, so we see this reduction in these dogs. We don't know why uh, it is affecting these dogs this way. Um, so the tracheal rings just cannot maintain their shape. And the best way I can um, uh, explain this is if you're thinking about the trachea as a straw and you're trying to uh, suck up a, a very thick shake and the straw collapses, you can't get anything through the straw once the, once the straw collapses or very little. So if we have a weak straw or a weak tracheal ring, things are not able to move through there. Air, pretty important, right? So if air cannot move through the trachea, we have a problem. In, when we do see it in young animals, it's primarily Yorkies, and it may be that we have a genetic condition that has that means that we have uh, lower levels of glycogen and glycosaminoglycan in this hyaline cartilage. 
Diagnosis will be the history of a paroxysmal cough. And again, that cough is paroxysmal, which means it's just a, a really reflexive cough. It'll be harsh and dry and kind of sound like a goose honking. Now, I'm going to make this sound, uh, and you will find yourself at some point making this sound in an uh, exam room with a client. So don't laugh at me because you're going to do it too. <gasps> is how it sounds. <gasps> Okay. So we get that sound both with collapsing trachea and with kennel cough. So we want to make sure that we are diagnosing which one it is, differentiating between the two. The cough will be worse with excitement, exercise, and then pulling on a collar. So we want to make sure that we have them on a harness versus a collar. And we often see this concurrent with heart disease. So we want to do a little uh, more digging when we see this collapsing trachea. Tracheal palpation, so again, we're pushing on the trachea and you'll get that goose honk, but remember, you will get that with kennel cough as well, so you want to do some other diagnostics to make sure you know what you're talking about. Hey, one thing you can do is an x-ray, so we want to do an x-ray anyway for kennel cough. We want to make sure we don't have pneumonia. Here is doing an x-ray for collapsing trachea, so if you think it might be collapsing trachea, one thing you want to do is do an x-ray on inspiration as well as expiration because inspiration is typically where we will see this collapse um, and expirate when we're seeing it on expiration which is a lot of times when we take our x-rays uh, we will not be able to see it so what we're seeing here is this is a the chest here are the shoulders of an animal the spine the ribs here is the lung shadow here is the or the i'm sorry the heart shadow and the lungs are black here is the trachea, and you can see air going through it because it is black. And this is a normal size trachea here. Here, as it goes into the thoracic inlet, you see the collapsed trachea. So air, it's very difficult to get air through that smaller tube there. Otherwise, physically, they'll be normal, except often obese. Uh, radiograph may not show. We need to see um, inspiration and expiration both lateral and DV view. So this is a lateral view, um, but also seeing this on a DV view or dorsal ventral view can be helpful. Bronchoscopy can show us, so we can stick a tube down there with a camera. Ultrasound, we may be able to see it with ultrasound. Fluoroscopy uh, is a moving x-ray, so you can watch them inspire and expire. And we want to rule out all the other causes of cough, which includes heart disease. Um, treatment. We can do symptomatic treatment. So if it's a, an acute case, we want to slow down their breathing, give them a, a sedative like acepromazine, um, put them on oxygen. Dexmethasone is a steroid uh, that we can give them to kind of um, decrease any inflammation. And then butorphanol. Uh, butorphanol is a, an opioid, but it also um, is an antitussive. Um, it, for chronic conditions, again, we want to keep make sure that their breathing is slow because the faster you try to move air through here, the quicker it'll collapse. Hycodan, which is a antitussive, butorphanol as an antitussive, prednisolone as a steroid, theophylline and terbutaline are bronchodilators. Surgically, we can fix this. We can put external prosthetic supports. The surgery is becoming better and better, but there are some complications that can occur that can make the procedure unrewarding. So we need to talk to the clients about that as well. It is a lifelong management issue. Um, treatment is for the reduction of inflammation and comfort for the animal. Um, to manage it, we need an aggressive weight reduction. We need to keep these guys skinny so there's not excess fat compressing on that trachea. We want to decrease exposure to any inhalant irritants that can cause inflammation of this smaller and um, weak trachea. So that includes cigarette smoke, perfume, candles. We want to use a harness instead of a collar. Um, if we have any respiratory infections crop up at all, we need to be very aggressive of our treatment of them. And then we also want to monitor for congestive heart failure because, again, we see this um, happening in conjunction with congestive heart failure. Feline asthma is due to chronic airway inflammation. So if they have an, a chronic inflammation of their airways over time, that will cause scarring. So then their lungs become less flexible. So they're not able to inhale and then exhale as much. What we will see with an acute case of asthma is uh, very quickly um, they, you will see labored breathing. So they will be sitting there or walking around and then all of a sudden start panting. Cats should not pant. 
that is not normal for cats. And we need to look at that. Cough could be chronic, so they could cough very um, for a very long time. Um, people may not notice it at first, maybe occasionally, and then it becomes more and more. So it can be happening for a long period of time before people really notice it. You may hear wheezing. And again, wheezing is, is because air is trying to move through smaller tubes. And then they could be lethargic just because they can't get enough oxygen to move around too much. Um, physical exam can be non-diagnostic. We could do a physical exam and hear nothing and see nothing. Um, but um, if they're having an acute um, attack, uh, we will hear the wheezing and the, uh, see the difficulty in breathing. With x-rays, and we may find this with x-rays of a cat that we think is otherwise normal, um, what we'll see are called diffuse. So diffuse means all over the chest, prominent, meaning we can see them very easily, bronchial markings or donuts. They look like donuts. So when we can see the bronchial uh, tubes, that means that there is usually something around the bronchial tubes that's highlighting them. In this case, we can see, especially over the heart, we can see, we should not be able to see this, this should just look like a white, whitish structure, but we can see outlines of the bronchioles of the lungs, and we should not be able to see that. We can see it here as well. Here is a nice big donut here uh, that we can see, and that's just showing us a cross section of a bronchial um, that is has inflammation around it or scar tissue around it, just excess tissue around it. Treatment, high-dose long-term corticosteroid like prednisone um, orally, daily, or Depomedrol, which is an injection that lasts for four to six weeks, sometimes as long as eight weeks. Oxygen therapy as needed. Bronchodilators like terbutaline or as a rescue um, uh, inhaler, ciproheptadine, if they're not responding to terbutaline. Um, prognosis is variable, depends on how bad they are. Uh, allergens, if we, if we see that allergens are the cause of it, we need to reduce the exposure to those allergens. Uh, most cats with asthma need periodic treatment. Uh, cats with chronic disease need continuous medication. That means every single day we're doing a treatment, a breathing treatment with an inhaler. And they do actually make this for cats. We may need to use, uh, bring them into the hospital if they're in crisis uh, for aggressive treatment. We need to get those airways opened up again. It's just like kids with asthma. Um, and again, just like kids with asthma, the more we can limit irritants to the airways, the better. So if you have a cat uh, whose owner smokes, we want to suggest to them that uh, now may be a good time to quit or we definitely don't want to smoke around the cats. Heartworm disease. Now, we know a lot about canine heartworm disease. I'm sure you're very familiar with it, um, that dogs get heartworm. A lot of people forget that cats get heartworm too. The problem with cats getting heartworm is that they don't have to get a very bad case of it for it to kill them. And here are the differences that we see. So as far as the biology of the worm as it lives in the dog versus the cat. So in dogs, we see the baby worms or the microfilaria in the blood. We call that microfilaremia in 30 to 80% of infected dogs. So it's very common to see these little um, buggers uh, swimming around in the blood. With cats, we very rarely see it. And when we do, it's transient. So we'll see it one day, but maybe not the next. Number of adult heart worms, greater than 50 is common in the dogs. One to three is common in cats. And because our antigen test tests for the antigen on adult female worms, we need to have a certain concentration for that test to be able to pick it up. And if it's less than two adult females, then we're probably not going to pick it up in the cat. That's why the antigen test for cats rarely works. Ectopic migration of the worm. Now, uh, worms, when they are in an abnormal host, will often get lost in the body. And so they will go to different parts of the body. We call that ectopic. They're not staying uh, where they're supposed to be in the, um, uh, in the blood vessels. And they move throughout the body and enter into organs or the eye or other places. Um, it's rare in a dog, but it's more common in cat. The adult lifespan of the worm is about five years in a dog and about two years in the cat. So that's the only good thing that the cat has going for it. Worms, the heartworm does not live as long in a cat. Clinical signs of heartworm disease. Um, most commonly, we don't see any clinical signs in the dog or the cat. 
Um, respiratory so signs we will see commonly in both. Um, vomiting is unusual in a dog, but fairly common in a cat. And I will give you a little hint here. When you see a cat that's vomiting, um, our first thought, especially with dogs, is that you know they've eaten something or there's a digestive issue. But cats vomit when they have heart disease as well, and we cannot forget that. Exercise intolerance is common in a dog, but rare in a cat. Ascites is common in a dog. That means um, you know fluid in the abdomen, and it's rare in a cat. Sudden death is rare in a dog, but it's more common in cats. So you see here, it's it's um, uh, it's a problem. Uh, radiographic findings. So when we take an X-ray of these guys, we will see characteristically enlarged pulmonary arteries. So the, um, we've got backing up in the right side, uh, in the left side of the heart, and so we'll get enlarged arteries in the lungs. Blunting and tortuosity of these arteries is common in the dog, and I and I showed you a picture of that in a uh, X-ray of heartworm uh, in the dog. Um, and it's uh, that spirally or corkscrew-like appearance to the vessels within the lungs. We will occasionally see that in a cat. Sometimes we'll see infiltrates into the lungs that's possible in both of these guys. Right-sided heart enlargement we'll see occasionally in a dog, but rarely in a cat. And there is a characteristic finding called a pulmonary artery knob where you see it almost looks like the artery stops there and um, there's a little knob, and that's just because there may be a, uh, a worm stuck at that particular, lo particular location. And it, that is characteristic in a dog, but we don't see it in a cat. So the clinical signs for heartworm disease in a cat, um, cough. Um, it, again, it's in the heart, but we see more pulmonary signs. So cough, dyspnea, weight loss, anorexia, vomiting, and lethargy. If it's a, an acute or paracute where they're, they're, they're having a major problem at this moment, maybe a, a stroke or a thromboembolism into the lungs, we'll get salivation, tachycardia, dyspnea, hemoptysis, which is blood coming up in the cough, um, CNS signs, so neurologic signs, and then sudden death. Here again, we're seeing this is a cat with heartworm disease. This cat, I will show you right here how it's twisted and we want to try not to get a twisted x-ray on a vd or a db but this cat's spine is right here and you see its sternum here so that means it's twisted off to the side a little bit the reason we don't like to see this in x-rays is that it will change how the 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 shape of the heart and it may make us think that we've got one side that's bigger than the other um, so that's just an um, something that we see in x-rays I want to warn you against. What we see here is a lot of pulmonary infiltrates. We see the very busy lungs here. And they should not look like that. Remember, we should see black in the lungs. So on the, on the lab for uh, heartworm disease for cats, uh, microfilarial and antigen tests are typically negative. Like I said, they have a very low worm, worm board burden. Uh, we want to send away, and if we are sus suspicious, we want to send away an antibody test. An antibody test the uh, cat's um, building of antibodies against the heartworm antigen. So if it's negative, that's 100% sure this cat does not have heartworm disease, has never had exposure to heartworms. But if it's positive, that tells us either we have an infection or inf infestation with heartworms, or we could have had a past exposure, so we have antibodies that remember what heartworms were like, or we might have an ectopic infection, meaning these worms are somewhere else in the body and, and actually not affecting the lungs at this time. X-rays will show us enlarged pulmonary arteries. They will be 1.6 times the width of the ninth rib. Let's go back to that slide here. If we count down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, here's the ninth rib. So if we see arteries that are um, uh, over one and a half times, pulmonary artery here, um, over one and a half times the size of this ninth rib, that's a good indication that we've got heartworm disease. Ultrasound, um, I have done ultrasounds on cats that I've suspected uh, heartworm disease, and I have seen these little linear foreign bodies in that pulmonary artery or in the right ventricle kind of fluttering around. It does take a little experience to see this, but if you do enough normal ultrasounds, you will see what the abnormal looks like pretty quickly. Treatment, unfortunately, is supportive care. We need to do cage rest, 
confinement. We may give them steroids to reduce inflammation. One thing that we are doing more often is giving them doxycycline. Doxycycline is an antibiotic that will kill a certain bacteria called Wolbachia that lives on the um, uh, lives on the parasite. And if we can kill that Wolbachia, it actually damages the parasite, which is really interesting. Uh, prevention: We do want to put them on Heart Guard, Sentinel, or Revolution for cats. It is a self-limiting issue. Unfortunately, if we don't keep these animals alive for the year or two that the heartworm is alive in them, then we will we may lose the cat. Both indoor and outdoor cats are at risk. If you get mosquitoes in your house, your cat is also at risk. Cats in endemic areas, meaning areas where we have heartworm, guess what? It's right here, should be on prevention. All right, we're gonna go into the uh, viral respiratory infections, um, particularly of cats. Now, canine, uh, can, uh, canines can get a uh, flu virus, which is an upper respiratory as well, and they get very, very sick with a flu virus. I don't have information about that in this lecture, um, but that flu virus is becoming more prevalent in this area, and so we do recommend vaccinating against it. Treatment is supportive, just like any virus uh, that we have, and occasionally we can put them on, if we catch it early, some antiviral medications, which will help support their immune system and help fight off the uh, infection a little bit sooner. So let's start talking about feline viral rhinotracheitis, which is also called feline herpes virus. It is highly, highly contagious, which means it has a high morbidity uh, rate, which means uh, cats within, that are exposed to it, almost every cat that expo is exposed to this virus will get it. But it, fortunately, it's a moderate mortality, so not every cat that gets this disease will die from it. Transmission is via aerosolization or sneezing and cat-to-cat -cat contact so that from grooming each other or touching each other, they can get it. It's inactivated in the environment within 18 to 24 hours, but cats can shed the virus for up to three weeks after infection. So they can be all better, but for three weeks, they're still shedding the virus. Clinical signs of the herpes virus is an acute onset of sneezing, conjunctivitis, so swollen eyes, See this little kitty and its swollen eyes, you can actually see the third eyelid is sticking up here because we have swollen conjunctiva. Purulent nasal discharge, so a, a really thick, uh, pussy nasal discharge, fever, depression, anorexia, ulcerated nasal planum. So back to this kitten here, you can see ulcerations here on this nasal planum. Excessive salivation, because they, they, they have ulcerations uh, in their mouth sometimes as well. Um, abortion in pregnant queens, corneal ulcers, so ulcers on their eyes, so ulcers everywhere. Diagnosis is through clinical signs. We can also take little nasal smears or actually scrape the conjunctiva of the eye uh, and put it on a slide and send it away, and they can do a um, direct immunofluorescence testing, which will show, we show here, we see these little organisms, that, these little viruses that actually fluoresce. Uh, with, the, with the proper reagent. So more on herpes, supportive treatment. Like I said, this is a virus. There's nothing we can do to kill the virus. We can give them antivirals, but it takes time to work and it's very expensive. The antivirals we can give them are idoxyuridine, uh, vidarabine, and trifluridine. Um, supportive treatment, give fluids, Broad spectrum antibiotics, why do we give antibiotics if it's anti, if we're looking for antivirals or it's a viral infection? Because if they're so sick from the virus, it leaves their body open to bacterial infections. So if we think we're gonna, we're so sick, we're gonna get a bacterial infection, well, we wanna put them on antibiotics. Decongestants to open up their nasal passageways so they can smell things, they can breathe. Vaporization of, um, uh, of air, if we can do humidified air, that always helps with uh, respiratory diseases. Antihistamines to decrease secretions. We want to clean up those eyes and nose. Increase the environmental temperature, make them feel nice and warm. Horse feed smelly food. So we want to warm up this food um, or give them really smelly, good canned food because if cats can't smell, they won't eat. We wanna decrease stress and we wanna avoid any cortisone treatment. So we don't wanna give any medication in the eyes or within the body that has any cortisone or steroids in it. Prevention, there is a vaccination. It's one of the core vaccinations. We wanna vaccinate. 
want to tell our clients that it's a very highly contagious disease. Um, even vaccinated cats will get a mild disease. We can transmit the, the virus via hands and clothes, so we want to definitely not touch animals after we've handled an animal with herpes virus. Warming that smelly food or warming war um, uh, any food can help bring out the smells so that they can smell it in order to eat it. Disinfectants will kill the herpes virus, and it is only infectious to cats. Feline Khaleesi virus, uh, this is very commonly seen in Khaleesi virus, these or, um, oral lesions, they're ulcerations, very, very painful. Um, you'll see fever, serous ocular nasal discharge, so it won't be purulent, you'll, it'll be a little bit more watery, mild conjunctivitis, and then these oral ulcerations, which will increase salvation, it's just very painful. Um, pneumonia is common with Khaleesi virus as well, so it can be very dangerous. And kittens can get an acute arthritis, so they get lame as well, and diarrhea, so it affects the GI system as well. So we diagnose via, via clinical signs, we can do a viral isolation. Treatment again is supportive, so we want to do good nursing care, give them some broad spectrum antibiotics if we are worried about a secondary infection. We may have to force feed them if they have ulcers and they don't want to eat, we've got to get them eating again. Um, oxygen therapy if they are having trouble breathing, and we need to disinfect this environment with bleach. Prevention, again, Khaleesi virus is uh, sometimes included within the core vaccine, but it isn't always. We do recommend that people with especially multiple cats or cats that they're bringing in constantly from the environment that they vaccinate against Khaleesi virus. So the signs will be, uh, you'll see it within five to six days. The ulcers will, will stay around for seven to 10 days. Um, there's no specific treatment for them. We just need to keep them comfortable. If uh, if they are salivating, it actually can lead to dehydration. It is so it's so severe. Force feeding may be necessary. This poor kitten with the ulcers. All right, pleural effusion. What is pleural effusion? Uh, when we talked about the the um, anatomy of the chest, um, we talked about the lining of the exterior wall with, or it's the interior wall, um, with the uh, the pleura, and then the, the pleural, uh, the, um, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, the lining of the organs with the pleura. And in between that, remember we said that there is space. Now, normally there's a small amount of fluid within that space, but if that uh, amount of fluid increases in that space through inflammation or hemorrhage or edema, because we have, um, uh, backup of fluids uh, because we have heart disease, this can cause uh, pleural effusion um, and it will separate those two uh, pleura and fill it with fluid. And you can see that the lungs here are given a much smaller space in which to expand. So this entire chest cavity is filled, filled with some type of fluid and that's called pleural effusion. Now, another interesting thing you will see here, this big bubble here is the stomach. This animal is obviously gasping for breath, uh, and so it's filling its stomach with air. Pleural effusion can happen with chronic uh, congestive heart failure, especially if it's right-sided. It's due to the increase in systemic venous hypertension. So as we get um, more pressure within the blood vessels, that fluid will leak out of those blood vessels and into the surrounding tissue. Um, it is a straw-colored transudate that we will pull from that um, congestive heart failure and that pleural effusion. So if we do a chest tube, we will see this straw-colored transudate. So it has some cells within it um, when we look under the microscope. If we have any intrathoracic neoplasia with obstruction of lymphatics, we will then get... Uh, just like when, when we get kind of a hypertension of the blood vessels, we'll get a hypertension of those lymph vessels traveling through the body with those blood vessels. And so then we'll get pushing out of the white cells into the pleural space as well. Um, so we, it, it can also cause inflammation, hemorrhage, obstruction of the venous drainage, mediastinal masses uh, within that smaller space between the lungs, like lymphoma, mesothelioma or metastatic uh, carcinomas will cause some um, fluid uh, in the mediastinal space as well. Empyema is a purulent exudative pleural effusion due to trauma, foreign body, or pulmonary infection. 
Um, and basically, it's kind of a pussy exudate uh, that we find in there. A chylothorax is an accumulation of lymphatic fluid arising from intest um, the intestines, and it contains a high concentration of fat. So what we see with a chylothorax is this white milky fluid, and it can be caused by any disease that increases systemic venous pressure. So a malignant tumor, pancreatitis, trauma, infection, parasites, idiopathic means that there are sometimes we have no idea what, what, what is happening. So we're an idiot for not figuring out the um, disease process that's uh, called idiopathic. Clinical signs of a pleural effusion, they will be having dis difficulty breathing. You saw that x-ray, there is no room for those lungs to expand. Um, they may have fever, cough, pleural pain. Um, we have to be very, very careful as we diagnose it. We have to be um, do x-rays typically to show the fluid accumulation. accumulation. Um, that picture of that animal that you saw earlier, I'm surprised that they were able to get that picture. Um, that animal is already uh, stressed out and now you have to hold it down on a table and it's having trouble breathing. It's just gonna get worse. We can only see fluid accumulation if we have more than 50 mils in small animals or more than 100 mils in large dogs. So we have to have a fair amount of fluid already accumulating in order to see it on an x-ray. We can do a thoracocentesis, which means that we're sticking a needle or an IV catheter into the, um, the thoracic space at a certain place. And we can show you how to do that. We stick it into a certain place and pull out the fluid. Now, I said the word transudate before, and I want to, and we've we said the word exudate before, and I want to kind of go over what does that mean. Um, so there are categories of fluids, and a transudate is, di is um, labeled a tra transudate if our protein that we find in there is less than 2.5, so there's less than 2.5 protein, um, there's less than 1,000 nucleated cells, there, or less than 5,000 in a horse. Um, we uh, in, in the transudate, we may see mesothelial or, or macrophage cells, um, although in the horse, we actually may see non-degenerated uh, neutrophils. Uh, the cause of uh, transudate is usually portal hypertension. So portal hypertension means around the liver, and it can be secondary to hepatic insufficiency or portal vein or liver vein hypoplasia. Could be due to a space occupying mass or severe hypoalbuminemia, which means we have a very low protein count. Modified transudate is between transudate and exudate. And so I'm going to actually skip over to exudate and tell you what an exudate is. Um, and you can look through modified transudate and the cause, causes of that. So it's important that when we get fluid from an animal that we're actually categorizing it as a transudate, modified transudate, or exudate, because it will give us what are those common causes, and it will help lead us to a diagnosis. An exudate has greater than 2.5 grams per deciliter of total protein, it has more than 5,000 nucleated cell cells per microliter, or more than 10,000 a horse. And the pr predominant nucleated cell type is a neutrophil. So this is basically, this is pus. So it's caused by inflammation. Um, it's usually a septic inflammation. It's happening throughout the body. Could be caused by just um, non-inflammation or inflammation due to non-septic, non-sepsis or no bacteria, uh, so a sterile inflammation. Um, we find that with feline infectious peritonitis or FIP. Um, it could, be, could happen um, because of there's an irritant like urine, bile, chyle, or a foreign body within uh, the fluid as well. Could be due to a space occupying mass. Unfortunately, all three of these could be due to a space occupying mass, so we have to diagnose that. Um, or in the horse could be due to an intestinal disorder um, when we're looking specifically at the abdomen. So when we're talking about these categories, we're talking about any fluid found in any space that it's not supposed to be. So transudate versus exudate versus modified transudate. Treatment depends on the cause and we need to treat underlying conditions. Congestive heart failure could be an underlying condition. So we need to do sometimes a therapeutic thoracocentesis, which means that we're treating the congestive heart failure, but we're also, as part of that treatment, we're removing that excess fluid uh, to get to a point where the animal can breathe again. And then we can hopefully maintain this with uh, medication. What removes fluid from the animal, excess fluid, 
that would be a diuretic like Lasix. Neoplasia, um, we could we, we sometimes also need to pull out fluid from the uh, chest or the abdomen, chest thoracocentesis. Um, uh, chemotherapy will help with neoplasia. Uh, pleurodesis is when we actually make a hole or, or remove a portion of the pleura so we can get better drainage uh, from that pleura. Pyothorax uh, is when we have pus in the thorax. Um, we may have to do a tube thoracostomy with continual drainage in order to continually remove this, um, put antibiotic, uh, give them antibiotic therapy based on the culture and sensitivity. It usually is a long-term treatment, lasts at least three months, and ampicillin, um, clindamycin, or chloramphenicol are medications that we'll typically give for a pyothorax. So we want to tell the uh, owner that pleural drainage will depend on the animal and the type of effusion. So it depends on what's in there, and we need to diagnose that first. We always need to treat the primary cause. Sometimes treatment is long-term and can be expensive, so we just need to prepare them for that. Um, and we need to see this animal back pretty uh, frequently to reevaluate them. All right, now we're going to talk about fungal diseases. Um, and I want to say anytime you need to take a break, press pause on this thing, go get a drink of water, stand up, stretch, take a break, uh, come back, and we'll, we'll all still be here talking. Um, so fungal diseases. Blastomycosis is a di dimorphic, meaning that it has two body forms. It has a spore and it has a, a, a branching um, fungus uh, formation, a branching kind of plant formation. Uh, histoplasmosis is also dimorphic, and it's found in the soil. Coccidiomycosis is also dimorphic, and it's also found in the soil. All three of these diseases can be taken in via inhalation. So these spores um, in the soil, dry soil, moist soil, um, animals are sniffing around, they breathe it in, the fungus is now in their system. Treatment for funguses are, is typically prolonged. Funguses are very good at hiding uh, from treatment and uh, 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 um, being able to grow through treatment. Uh, relapses are very common and prognosis is guarded to grave, unfortunately. So here are some just uh, some uh, drawings of some fungal diseases that show you this dimorphic um, structure. So when we say dimorphic, there are some branching structures, and then we also have these little spores. Blastomyces uh, dermatidides, uh, this is um, the branching. It has one branch with a little uh, spore that comes off, and here's what the spore looks like. Coccidio uh, coccidioides um, has uh, more packets, um, and these little packets um, come off, and these are the little spores here. Histoplasma capsulatum and paracoxoides. Um, coccidioides um, are two other ones as well. So blasto, coccidio, and histo are the most common ones that we see. We also have opportunistic fungi, uh, fungi that will come in if we have a, a bacterial, it's always, always in the environment, we have some sort of bacteria going on or some other type of infection, this opportunistic fungi comes in and, so, and takes over and says, hey, I've got this now. So candida is a very common um, yeast that we will see. Cryptococcus neoformans is an encapsulated uh, fungi, and then aspergillus we see very often as well. So blastomycosis, um, inhalation and wound contamination, two ways we can get this. Incubation is five to 12 weeks. That means it's in the system, slowly growing, and, and at five to 12, 12 weeks we start to see the signs. Clinical forms, um, primary pulmonary infection, we can also have disseminated disease, so throughout the body, or just a local cutaneous um, infection. Clinical signs will depend on where, what kind of clinical form we have the blasto. Uh, anorexia, depression, weight loss, fever, greater than 103 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, cough, dyspnea, ocular and nasal discharge, wound exudates, lymphadenopathy, and um, central nervous system signs, so they can be neurologic. Treatment is amphotericin B. Um, one to three times a week, it has lots of side effects, so we don't use it often unless we have to. Ketoconazole, we use for 66 days, it only has a 33% cure rate. And then we can also use itraconazole for long-term therapy. Here's our little guy, uh, blastomycosis. Often we will send these um, off to a, uh, a 
pathology lab in order to diagnose the fungal infections. Histoplasmosis, we get it from soil, bird, and bat droppings, inhalation, and they have a very quick turnaround, a, five, a 12 to 16 day incubation period. It also affects the GI. So what we'll see um, is uh, with uh, CBC, it'll be an anemia that's non-regenerative. Um, the x-rays show a diffuse or linear interstitial patterns in the thorax with ascites in the abdomen. Um, cytology or histopath will actually, if we can get a, a culture or a, a sign of this, um, uh, a sample of this uh, exudate, uh, we can send that away and, and see these on the slide. Um, serology, uh, oftentimes we'll send, if we have a suspicion of a fungal infection, we'll send um, serum away, but we will often get false negatives for fungus. Um, cats generally get a pulmonary disease. We see weight loss, anorexia, fever, pale mucous membranes, dyspnea sometimes, hepatomegaly, uh, peripheral lymphadenopathy, and some ocular lesions. With canine, we see more of the GI form. They'll have weight loss, diarrhea, large bowel diarrhea, which means that we have small amounts of diarrhea and they tend to be full of mucus and blood, uh, pale mucous membranes, a cough, and a low-grade fever. Treatment is ketoconazole for three months or itraconazole. Both of those are antifungal medications. Cryptococcus is a budding yeast that is surrounded by a mucoid capsule. It's pretty easy to see on a slide. Um, we get it through inhalation, especially from in immunosuppressed individuals. It's common in avian droppings. Um, clinical signs for cats, it's um, most commonly, a, it's the most common systemic mycosis in a cat. They get a nasal cavity or sinus lesion, chronic nasal discharge, nasal granulomas, lymphadenopathy. They may have some CNS signs. About 25% of them have CNS signs. They may have eye signs or ocular signs a low-grade fever, kind of a malaise, which means, eh, I don't feel so good. They don't want to move around so much. Weight loss and anorexia. We don't see it as commonly in the dog, and when we see it, we most often see it as a, a neurologic sign or vestibular sign. Vestibular sign means that they have uh, poor balance function, so it's like an inner ear disease. Um, they also get skin lesions. Diagnosis, diagnosis through cytology, um, or an antigen test. The prognosis is fair to good. There's no health hazard for humans. The treatment is a minimum of two months with either amphotericin B, which we know there are a lot of side effects to, 5-flucytosine, ketoconazole, or itraconazole. Coccidioid mycosis is found in the southwest U.S. And you might say, hey, I don't live in the southwest U.S., but we do have uh, people who travel and we have animals who travel. We see this most, most often in young male dogs that are, um, and it's weeks to years of incubation. So it might be somebody who moved from Arizona to Ohio years ago. Um, clinical signs would be mild cough, mild fever, anorexia, weak, uh, weight loss, weakness, depression, lameness, soft tissue swelling, if it's in the bone, because um, it can get into the bone. Um, we may have lymphadenopathy and myocarditis, skin lesions, and uh, central nervous system signs. Diagnosis through cytology or biopsy. Radi uh, radiographs may show parenchymal changes, and that means just um, changes around the lungs. Uh, serology um, will show us titers, um, so we have to see if they have a certain concentration. Um, so if they have a concentration of greater than 1 to 16, we know that they have an active infection. If it's greater than one to 30, I'm sorry, if it's greater than one to 32, we know it's active. It's, if it's greater than one to 16, we know that it's somewhere in their body. Uh, ketoconazole or itraconazole for six to 12 months. So it's a really long term if we want to get to remission, but it does stay in the body for a long period of time. And this is what we're talking about, this coccidiomycosis. Aspergillosis. Aspergillosis is something we see across the species. Um, it is caused, uh, it's a fungus that likes to grow in decaying vegetation, sewage sludge, compost piles, moldy seeds, and grains. And you might say, well, I don't go anywhere near there, and I don't let my dog go anywhere near there. Well, um, these are things that are nice smelling things for dogs. They have a lot of information in them, and so they do go and they sniff those, um, uh, the, the nasty stuff. Um, so obviously, they get it through inhalation. 
and it usually just stays in the nasal cavity of the dog. This is a fuzzy picture, but if you look at this dog, you can see kind of a, a discharge out of this one nostril, and we have a decaying tissue here too. This is a black nose, but now we have it down to here, granulation tissue, and that will scar down. So with cats, we don't see very commonly, but cats with leukemia virus, when they have a decreased immune system, it'll be more common. Abnormal lung, GI, liver, spleen, and renal function, function, they'll have lethargy and fever, weight loss and anorexia. So in cats with leukemia, it will be generalized and go throughout the body. Cat uh, dogs, um, they can get both a localized and a generalized disease. Um, with young middle-aged dogs, we'll see a chronic nasal discharge. Usually, usually it's unilateral, as in this case, sneezing or stertorous breathing and facial pain because it will affect the, the nerves of this area as well. German Shepherd dogs, anywhere between one and seven years, for some reason this uh, aspergillosis will go um, throughout the body. So we'll see weight loss and anorexia, fever, lameness, back pain, paresis and paralysis, and some ocular signs. Here's some uh, pictures of these lovely little growths of aspergillosis. They form little packs within um, body tissue. Uh, here is it. Here it is uh, branching filaments underneath a slide. Um, we can do x-rays uh, of the nasal turbinates and we'll actually see a loss of those nas nasal turbinates. This, these funguses will eat into those structures. Biopsy and en endoscopy, we'll see a yellow, green, um, to gray, black, I'm sorry, I should say gray, black fungal plaques in the nasal mucosa. We can use topical clotrimazole through an indwelling nasal catheter. So we can actually put a, a catheter and, and suture it in place into the nasal cavity and um, twice a day put in a small amount of clotrimazole. This also affects birds, ruminants, and horses. And if you'll remember, I said aspergillosis is that one fungus that does get into the guttural pouch of horses and into the sinuses of horses and causes some major problems. All right, pulmonary neoplasms. These are um, primary lung tumors. Uh, they're relatively uncommon, but if we do see them, most of them are adenocarcinomas. So 70 to 80% of primary lung tumors are adenocarcinomas. And that just tells us what uh, cell that they grow out of. It, we typically will see it in dogs that are 9 to 12 years old. They may metastasize to regional lymph nodes, the long bones, the heart, the brain, the eye, and immediate stinal lymph nodes. Um, it is uh, generally we see a uh, neoplasm or cancer in the lungs due to metastatic disease, particularly thyroid and mammary glands goes straight to the lungs, but any neoplasm will go to the lungs as well. It's just a very highly vascularized structure. And so uh, um, it's just one place that these uh, neoplastic cells will, will end up. That's why when we're diagnosing any cancer, we often get a chest X-ray. We wanna look for metastatic disease in the lungs. Clinical signs, um, if it's a primary neoplasia, we'll see a non-productive cough, exercise intolerance, weight loss, poor condition, dysphagia, meaning they're having trouble eating and swallowing, vomiting, and anorexia. If it's metastatic, we'll see the evidence of the primary tumor first, first and then we'll see everything um, that you see with the primary signs or the primary tumor. Diagnosis is through thoracic rads, but the problem is they can have metastatic disease in the lungs if we're, if we're testing for a metastatic disease, if we're going to miss lesions that are less than five millimeters. So we always warn owners that, um, that we're going to do these x-rays. And if we tell them that there's no lead, we can't see any lesions in the lungs, we also say, but there could still be um, tumor cells there. They're just not big enough for us to see. Now, when we do diagnostic thoracic rads looking for cancer in the lungs, it is important to do three views. We need to do two lateral views. And the reason is anything closest to the plate is actually magnified. So remember, we're trying to look for small lesions. We need to magnify them as much as possible. So we want to do right and left lateral and a VD, so ventrodorsal. If they're having difficulty breathing, we can leave them on the sternum and do a dorsal ventral. If we can, we want to try to get a biopsy or a cytology of these lesions. Um, 
we may need to do surgery. Um, we can remove uh, portions of lungs. And then if we, can, but if we, we are able to remove a primary uh, neoplasia, uh, you, doing chemo secondarily is important because we have to remember that these metastasize very quickly. Reptiles, they also get upper and lower airway diseases. Uh, they get an infectious stomatitis and they get pneumonia. And the most common bacteria that we see with this is Aeromonas and Pseudomonas species. Um, typically they get this because of poor management. Like I said, anytime we see, or you will hear this at least later, anytime we uh, see an, uh, an exotic animal, it's typically because we have poor techniques for keeping it at home, so poor management. So if we don't have good temps or a good um, range of temperatures for this animal to choose where it needs to be, if we have unsanitary conditions, they're not cleaning the area environment as, as often as they should, if they have concurrent disease, so something else is affecting them, or if they're malnourished and have hypovitaminosis A, that leads to more chances that they're going to get um, an infection. Pneumonia, we'll see respiratory um, with respiratory issues or parasitic issues. If they have parasites, um, one of the life cycles, of parts of the life cycle of the parasite is to travel through the bloodstream and they end up in the lungs and are coughed up and swallowed back down. That happens in mammals as well. Open mouth breathing, um, dyspnea, trouble breathing, or anorexia, they won't eat. And then also we see a stomatitis. So we'll see petechia or little pinpoint uh, bruising or bleeding um, in the oral cavity. We'll also see a caseous material along the dental arcade. And here's the picture here. We see and it's basically an abscess within the mouth. And uh, we'll get this um, cottage cheese-like material that we have to express out of this and lavage uh, an antiseptic within the mouth. Those are the respiratory diseases we're going to talk about. Um, I hope you got something out of this. I would definitely go back through it and pick out some things that you might have questions about we can discuss in class. Thanks for listening.